Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you, and I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us for this very important and significant symposium. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Father Michael Cherney. Father Michael is the Chief of Staff for uh, Cardinal Turkson at the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, but a man with his own credentials as well, which I'd like to share with you. Father Cherney was born in Czechoslovakia and raised in Montreal, where he attended Loyola High School and later entered the Society of Jesus, which means he's a Jesuit, as our Holy Father, Pope Francis. Uh, he was, is a member of the English Canada province, was ordained a priest in 1973. He did his graduate studies at the University of Chicago, an interdisciplinary program in humanities, social thought, and theology and earned his doctorate in 1978. After the um, 1989 assassination of the Jesuits that some of you, if not many of you, will remember at the Central American University in San Salvador, he became director of its Human Rights Institute and served in that role from 1990 to 1991 and as the vice rector of the Central American University. He contributed to the UN-mediated negotiations which brought about an end to the Civil War there in 1991. For 11 years, Father Cherney served as Secretary for Social Justice at the Jesuit General Curia in Rome. He participated in the 1995 34th General Congregation and in a three-man United Nations fact-finding mission to Haiti. From 2002 to 2010, he served as founding director of the African Jesuit AIDS Network, which assists Jesuits in some 30 countries of the continent to respond to the HIV AIDS pandemic in an effective, evangelical, and coordinated manner. In 2009, Pope Benedict XVI appointed him to the Second Synod of Bishops for Africa. And since 2010, he's been serving as an advisor and counselor to the president of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, Cardinal Peter Turkson of Ghana. When I went to Rome for an Adlimina visit a couple of years ago, and when I was back again this March, I had the opportunity to meet with Cardinal Turkson and with Father Cherney in preparations for this very symposium. And they were both very generous in the amount of time that they gave the kind of thoughtful and insightful questions that they asked and just particular issues that they anticipated as we looked to putting together this gathering. So the Catholic Rural Life Conference is very uh, grateful for the assistance that we've received from the Pontifical Council and particularly through the interest and assistance of Father Michael. So Father Michael, we're glad that you're able to be with us and we welcome you at this time. Well, Reverend Bishops and other church representatives agricultural leaders, students and professors, and dear friends. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, as uh, Bishop Etienne just said, we've been long in the looking forward to this conference and in the preparing for it. And I can uh, assure you that Cardinal Turkson very much regrets not being able to be here in person. Uh, at the same time, I think he was very confident that you would understand the priority right now of dealing with the Ebola crisis, and especially the opportunity this week to uh, coordinate a Vatican response that would uh, not only help to meet the crisis, but would also uh, set a kind of pace and a tone and leadership for the church and other people of faith around the world to respond. So in uh, uh, in this situation of replacing him, I have the feeling that we are all also supporting the church's mission uh, to respond to, to this particular crisis. And it is, uh, it is wonderful, and it has been already pointed out, to participate in a, a really historic uh, meeting 
that is bringing together people from different sectors or different corners of this great uh, problematic of food, uh, agriculture, and the environment, and to do so together as brothers and sisters in faith. So I thank you for uh, your welcome to me, and I in turn, in the name of Cardinal Turkson and of the, Vat of the Pontifical Council, am very happy to welcome you. Uh, just over 50 years ago, the Second Vatican Council called for new thinking and new prayer on the mission of the church in the modern world. And it was uh, a moment when the church, with all her tradition, and with all her resources, uh, wanted to uh, renew our ability to accompany humanity in its walk through history. And that really, I think, is the underlying theme of what we are talking about. No church document says it more eloquently than the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes. And I will repeat words which are practically a prayer for us. The joys and the hopes the griefs and the anxieties of the men, women, and children of this age, and I would add now, and of future ages, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. In a recent meeting uh, of the Food and Agricultural Organizations of the UN in Rome, Pope Francis addressed these words which translate the affirmation I just read into a contemporary blessing. He said to the people at FAO, the Catholic Church, with all her structures and institutions, is at your side. That is, at the side of everyone who seeks, in good faith, to meet the challenges of world hunger and ensuring a sustainable supply of food while at the same time being good stewards of the gift of creation for future generations. And just last week, the Holy Father addressed a extraordinary gathering of about 150 representatives of grassroots movements from all over the world. And we were meeting in the old Synod Hall, and the Holy Father pointed out that Synod means to walk with, to walk together, to make our way together. And I think Synod, in that sense, is a symbol of the process that he was supporting and that he wants to see the whole church involved in, a church which walks with the men, women, and children of this age and of future ages, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted. So how to walk with? And I think that the word dialogue is a good short answer to the question how to walk with. This spirit of dialogue is beautifully expressed in the same document of Vatican II, giving witness and voice to the faith of the whole people of God gathered together by Christ. This council, the Vatican II, can provide no more eloquent proof of its solidarity with, as well as its respect and love for the entire human family, than by engaging, it, engaging with it in conversation about these various problems of the world, and that includes the list of problems we're facing these days. So we express respect, love, and solidarity by engaging in conversation about these burning issues. And so we want to ask how our future leaders can inform their values, can inform with their values and ethics in the agricultural and food industries, exploring the intersection of faith, food, and the environment. That's why we are so grateful for this symposium taking place and why the Pontifical Council is so happy to be able to cooperate with practically all the sponsoring organizations in putting on the symposium. When we share a common commitment to conversation, to dialogue, we place ourselves at the service of truth and recognize the legitimate contributions of others 
even at times when we and they disagree. And so, because the stakes are high and tempers tend to run short and sharply divergent views makes, make the conversation shrill, when that happens, as the Council foresaw, we must courageously go even further and deeper than conversation, than dialogue. The Church sincerely professes that all people, believers and unbelievers alike, ought to work for the rightful betterment of the world, in which all alike need to live. And such an ideal cannot be realized, however, apart from sincere and prudent dialogue. Now, one example of dialogue, which uh, has already been mentioned, we'll continue to mention it, are the meetings which went into the eventual birth of this handbook, uh, meetings which our Pontifical Council held with the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies of Los Angeles in October 2010, and then with the, uh, with the John A. Ryan Institute for Catholic Social Thought in February 2011. And the purpose of these two conferences was to explore how business leaders can live out their call to love while managing their respective organizations in the challenging times and striving together for the common good. How is this possible? The answer is the set that we were able to formulate is in the set of reflections entitled Vocation of the Business Leader. This handbook offers business leaders, members of their institutions and their stakeholders, a set of practical principles that can guide them in their service of the common good. It is intended as an educational aid that addresses the vocation of the businessmen and women who act in a wide range of business institutions, cooperatives, corporations, family businesses, and so forth. And this, in this variety, the challenges and opportunities that the business world offers them in the context of intense technological and communication change, short-term financial practices, and profound cultural challenges. So I'm happy to report that we are now just about ready to launch the fourth edition in English of the handbook, and that the resource has been translated into 15 languages. But as we reflect upon the process we went through to, to develop this resource, we have been challenged to go even deeper into particular vocations that are essential for the future of humanity. Among those deserving attention, and I think you will surely agree, are the roles of political leaders, both elected leaders and professional public servants. The role of engineers, people who translate science into technology, into products, and even the vocation of the judiciary. But the most active project, following up on the vocation of the business leader, is the one that we're treating at this symposium, to explore the vocation of the agricultural leader in at least the three dimensions of our title, food, the environment, and faith. So in these uh, introductory remarks, let me reflect with you a little bit on the issue of food as it introduces our work this, uh, these three days. Food is surely unique. Food sustains life itself. It is not just another product. As Christians, providing food for all is a gospel imperative, not just another a policy choice. Eating is a moral act because it is a human act, and human acts can be morally evaluated. But food and agriculture have become distant, abstract, anonymous. For many people, food comes from the grocery store or from the fast food restaurant. Agricultural production, including fishery, is a distant reality. It's not seen much, and it's even less understood we have become disconnected from how our food is produced. This disconnection results in putting trust in an industrial system that provides the food for us, and as if it has nothing really to do with us. Last week, again, addressing those representatives of popular 
organizations, including peasant movements, the landless and indigenous peoples, Pope Francis lifted up these very issues around land and agriculture, including land grabbing, deforestation, expropriation of water, inappropriate pesticides, and culminating in the genuine scandal and crime of hunger in the world, while at the same time, tons of food are simply discarded. Issues like these, whether far away or here at home, are ours to address during this symposium. For ours is the responsibility as Christians to consider the important underlying ethical questions. And here are a few of them. How can hunger in the human family be overcome? How can we ensure affordable, safe, and sustainable food supply? How can we ensure that farm workers and owners of small farms in the United States and around the world live and work with dignity? How can land, water, and other elements of God's creation be preserved, protected, and used well in the service of the common good? How do we respond to the effects of climate change? How do we address the causes of climate change? How can rural communities in this country and around the world survive and thrive? My dear brothers and sisters, as you can perhaps discern from this list, the challenges are daunting and perhaps appear overwhelming. But confident in the one God who is the truth and strengthened by the spirit who works in the secret of every human heart, we can together take up the task of entering into a fruitful and faithful dialogue at the service of humanity and a quest for a more just and peaceful order among men and women everywhere. When we place our concerns before the discerning minds of all people of goodwill and draw upon the grace of the Holy Spirit, the source of all truth, we cannot help but proceed in great confidence and hope for our church and for each other in the modern world. And so in conclusion, I do challenge everyone attending this symposium to utilize all the gifts God has given each of you, your wisdom, your experience, and your creativity to discuss and wrestle with these questions together so that we can provide resources for the next generation of food and agricultural leaders who are committed to the common good and informed by faith to address the food and environmental challenges before us. So I thank you very much, and I wish us all a truly blessed and fruitful symposium. Thank you.